There's also an old Chinese proverb um, that I think George Orwell was fond of using, and it says, um, he who controls the past shapes the future. And I think Michael Gove uh, is taking that one to heart, hasn't he? Um, the Tories are really out to reinvent the First World War as a just war and, real, and as a celebration of Britishness when we were all in it together then as we're all in it together now. Um, actually, it was a war between empires. It was a war for empire. Um, it was the most barbaric uh, thing that ever happened in history to that point. 65 million people were mobilised for war. Depending on what statistics you want to believe, somewhere between 10 and 16 million of them were killed. Another 20 million were maimed or badly wounded. And on top of that, 10 million civilians died as a consequence of the war. And that doesn't include the, uh, the Spanish flu pandemic that uh, occurred in 1919 as a consequence of the dislocation the war caused to Europe. Um, for the British especially, but for all the countries, but for the British especially, uh, previous wars had been wars where professional armies went away to lands overseas to fight and it didn't have much of an impact in the civilian population. The First World War was entirely different from everything that had gone before. It was total war. It was a war where the whole of social life and where the whole of the economy was subordinated to the war economy. There's a great quote I'm going to give you, which I think sums it up, from James Hinton, who wrote a book in the First Shop Stewards Movement. I believe it's now out of print, but if it isn't, folks should try and get a hold of it to read it. It's a great book. He says, It was a war whose fate was decided as much in the workshops of Britain and Germany as it was in the trenches of France. The context of blood and iron is at the same time the context of intensified social discipline, of domestic repression. A munitions worker through most of the war, could expect to escape the particular horror of the trenches. But there was no exemption from the generalised violence of war. War brutalised and simplified social relations at home as well as in the front. It lent its own violence and its own urgency to the workers' perennial fight for economic security and for class power. And in that sense, the war had a massive impact on women, particularly working-class women. When the war started, the percentage of women who worked in munitions would have been tiny, probably less than 10%. By 1917, the, per the, 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 the ratio of women in, in, in munitions factories and the shell factories was 73%. Um, one and a half million women got jobs during the war, largely as a consequence of, people going off, of men going off to fight it. Um, women in trade unions before the war were 300,000 in number. That trebled during the war to over one million. Um, the other thing about it is, if you went to Brit British school to get history, the war is about the Western Front, and the Western Front was important, but it was a truly global war. It was a European war, but it was also a global war that affected virtually all of the world. Um, again, I think it's worth going over that to a certain extent. Um, and one, on one side, there was what was called the Triple Entente, which was essentially the three big empires of Britain, France and Tsarist Russia. And they were backed by Italy, who didn't join the war until 1915, because originally they were going to be on the other side, but they reckoned there was more loot to join the British and the French than to fit and fight inside the Germans. The, the Italian ruling class were split over which imperialist war they would support. Um, they were also backed by Belgium, Portugal, Greece, Romania, Serbia, Montenegro, Japan, and from early 1917, the United States of America. Remember, too, as British colonies, India, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, most of the other British colonies in Africa, and the West Indies provided some four million troops to the war. You don't read about that too much in history either. These combined forces faced what were called the Central Powers, um, the alliance between Germany, Turkey and its huge Ottoman Empire, which essentially in 1914 straddled the whole of the Middle East, um, Bulgaria and uh, Austro-Hungary, the Central European Empire that was ruled by the Habsburg dynasty. And it incorporated, as well as Austria and Hungary, uh, 
It included what is now modern Czech and Slovak republics, uh, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Romania and bits of Poland. 42 million were mobilised on the triple entente side and about 23 or 24 million on the side of the central powers. It was an enormous global war. Um, it's, it's, it spread from the Western Front in, in, in Flanders and the Eastern Front in the Russia-German border to the, uh, the Alps, um, the, the border between Italy and Austria. It spread to Greece, the Balkans, Turkey. Um, it spread throughout the Middle East to the, the whole of the Ottoman Empire, to Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, Jordan. Um, and as well as that, there was sporadic fighting uh, throughout Africa, New Guinea, Samoa, China and the Pacific Islands. And there was naval warfare too. In the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the North Sea, the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean. The Allies imposed right at the start of the war a naval blockade on Germany and the Central Powers and the Germans retaliated by a submarine war that brought ostensibly America into the war in 1917. The, the, the European revolution that the war provoked brought it to an abrupt end in November 1918 and forced the armistice and it also toppled the empires and it toppled the monarchies of Europe. Um, but the, the, the insurgent workers movement was contained eventually and uh, the Versailles Settlement of 1919 basically repartitioned the world in a way that laid the base for an even bloodier, more barbaric war in 1939, 20 years on. Iraq, that was known as Mesopotamia before the war, shows how the fault lines that were drawn by the Treaty of Versailles uh, really still destabilise the world today. 1914 war followed a series of wars, very reminiscent of where we are today. The Boer War of uh, 1899 to 1902, the Russian-Japanese War of 1904, and the two Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913. Um, the rivalry between the present-day superpowers is uh, incredibly reminiscent of the, those regional proxy wars um, that were fought in the build-up to 1914, so that should worry us. So the First World War isn't just a history lesson, it's really about the future as well and where we're going, and therefore that's why I think it's quite important to learn the lessons of it. Another reason why it's important to learn the lessons of it is that before 1914, the German socialist, a man regarded at the time as the Pope of Marxism, and that's what the socialists called him, Karol Kautsky, um, argued that as capitalism grew older, it would become more benign and it would remove the tendency to go to war. 1914 proved them wrong. But there are people around today who still believe that. People will remember the peace dividend that we were going to get at the end of the Cold War. Or Gordon Brown in the 90s telling us how capitalism had solved its booms and slumps and therefore we could look forward to a prolonged period of peace, prosperity and growth. Ha, ha. Um, <laughs> these are the reasons why we really need to understand what happened in 1914. Now, there's a mountain of literature about it, um, and believe me, because when you write a book and you start to look at it, and it's not possible to cover it all. But essentially, it's dominated by two very different uh, explanations of the war. The first one is, like, was it a mistake, a series of diplomatic blunders? Or the second one was, no, it was a necessary, unavoidable war, and it was caused by aggressive German militarism. As Tory military historians like Max Hastings argue, people will have seen, no doubt, Max Hastings on the television telling us why 1914 was a just war and it had to be fought. Um, Hastings' version of the war is essentially the reason for what happened at Versailles when the victors wrote history, when the victors said it was Germany to blame and, and, and punished Germany. Um, there's a former Sandhurst Military Academy lecturer called Gary Sheffield who, if people read the ISJ, this quote's in it, because Megan Trudell also mentions it, but I've got it in my book. I think it um, explains it quite well, what he said, uh, their position. Um, Britain went to war with Germany in 1914 for similar reasons to those which the country fought Hitler's Germany in the Second World War, to prevent an authoritarian, militarist, expansionist enemy achieving hegemony in Europe and imperiling British security. The fact was that in 1914, Germany waged a war of aggression that conquered large tracts of its neighbours' territory. As has often been pointed out, there were distinct continuities between the policy of Imperial Germany and its Nazi successor. 
No, whether, whether the truth of World War II, um, most people still view it as a war against fascism. World War I doesn't have those merits. Um, Kaiser's Germany was certainly imperialist and mil militaristic, but hey, wait a minute, people in glass houses shouldn't be throwing stones, <laughs> especially if you live in Britain. I mean, by 1914, Britain had amassed over 200 years an empire that Germany could only dream of. It was the Union Jack, isn't he, called the butcher's apron for no reason. That's why. You know, from Oliver Cromwell in Ireland, his exploits, until Kitchener's butchery of the Sudanese forces at the Battle of Omdurman in 1898, you know, Germany's got a lot to learn about imperialism from Imperial Britain. And that point has to be made. I think the argument that's been pushed today by the anti-German camp is as much about the present as the past. Why, it's not just a simple matter for history. It's an argument, a little Englander argument, about Europe, about a German-dominated EU being anti-democratic, and hence, you know, UKIP, the Tories. That argument's prevalent, but I don't think it stands up at all. The other dominant argument is probably probably best represented by Chris Clark's book, The Sleepwalkers, which is much better. It puts to bed the myth of uh, Germany's guilt for the war quite well, I think, and points out Germany wasn't the only imperialist power. Um, but I think the problem with Chris Clark's book is it sidesteps the whole question of responsibility and the reason for the war, the war altogether. And I'll, and I'll quote from him as well. If I could find my quote. And although I'm being critical of it, I don't think that folks should not read it. Um, it's full of useful new facts um, that, 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 that folk can learn from. He says, the outbreak of war is not an Agatha Christie drama where we discover the culprit standing over the corpse in the conservatory with a smoking pistol. Viewed in this light, the outbreak of war was a tragedy, not a crime. The protagonists were sleepwalkers, watchful but unseeing, haunted by dreams, yet blind to the reality of the horror they were about to bring into the world. Now, to explain 1914 as an accident or as a series of blunders is to ignore the bellicose nature of capitalism and what imperialism was up to at the time. What Clark describes as blind, unintended acts by the politicians and the generals across Europe actually just wouldn't do. It's a cover-up. Um, it, it actually fails to tackle what the problem is. Because I, I want to argue that they acted, in the words of Karl Marx, who was dead by this time, like a band of warring brothers. Um, that they were committed to a system um, that was based on competitive accumulation, and they were driven by its logic. And that's why they went to war. And this is worth stressing, because there's another uh, genre, genre in the First World War which sees the problem as simply the stupidity of the generals. And take it from me, a lot of them are stupid. I'm not doubting that. But it really doesn't explain the war at all. I mean, typical of this is there's, I mean, and it's accepted by a lot of people. Um, is it, it, there's a book by Aidan Gregory called The Last Great War. Not the greatest book, but he makes this point. He says, the stupidity of the war has been a theme of growing strength since the 1920s. From Robert Graves through Oh What a Lovely War to Blackadder, the criminal, idiocy, the criminal idiocy of the British High Command has become an article of faith. Lampooning the military is preferable to rehabilitating them as the Tories want to do, but um, it doesn't explain what caused the war. Um, I mean, to be honest, you have to ask the question, would the war have been acceptable if it was run more humanely or more efficiently? If there had been less casualties, if it had only been five million or four million? No, of course not, and it doesn't explain the war at all. So therefore, I, have, I think you have to look at the fact that um, the generals, the politicians, and the boss class went to war, decided to go to war. Some of them did it gleefully. If you read Winston Churchill, he was rubbing his hands at the outbreak of the First World War. Some of them did it with foreboding and real trepidation, but went to war they went. And they went to war because they were the representatives of capital, imperialist capital, that was fighting each other. And they were driven to go to war. You know, it's not, not only us that are, in a sense, the prisoners of the system, it's also the ruling class. They're driven by a system that they're committed to. And I think that explains why they went, why, why they went to war. Now, 
I mean, I spoke about Marx, and Marx explained that accumulation. If you read Marx's stuff, and Marx is writing before there really is world capitalism, Marx is predicting the growth of world capitalism. He's writing about capitalism when it exists in a few pockets in probably, you know, Lancashire, central Scotland, and Belgium. But he says that accumulation is obligatory, that if capitalists, um, if a business doesn't exploit to accumulate and accumulate to exploit, then it will go to the wall. And the important thing is that in 1914, the Russian socialists Lenin and Bukharin used Marx's um, insights into early capitalism to apply it to what they saw developing as monopoly capitalism in the 21st century. Not a capitalism in, of round trees and terries in New York, but of huge trusts. And they, they, they they showed how the war was connected to the development of capitalism. And because they showed that and understood it, they were able to contend the war uh, effectively. Um, they identified three key facts. And both Lenin in, the high, in Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, and Bukharin's book, Imperialism in the World Economy. First of all, um, they showed that the growth of capitalism leads to military competition um, complementing and, at times, replacing economic competition for markets and profits. Secondly, they showed that in every capitalist country, increasing concentration into fewer firms, and fewer, these fewer firms were increasingly integrated into the nation-state. And thirdly, they showed, um, when I find it, um, that the production that took place could no longer be constrained within the boundaries of those nation states. Now, this meant that there was a, there's a contradiction. There's a contradiction between capital's reliance in the nation state and capital's search for globalisation. And that could only be reconciled if the nation state started to operate out with its boundaries, started to be an imperialist power and became increasingly an imperialist power. It meant that states had to plunder other states, take other territories, have influence over other territories. But more important than that, it meant they had to have ever bigger armies, ever bigger navies, ever more sophisticated weaponry to protect their markets and to seize the markets of their, their competitors. In other words, it was Marx's argument that one capitalist kills many, but it was on a huge global scale and an enormous scale. The logic of all that was really like a permanent war economy. Um, militarisation and war. Now, Engels, as far back as 1887, had understood this. I mean, there's a great, again, a quote in the book, I don't have quite time to quote it here, where Engels predicts, 20 years before it, the nature of the First World War. He predicts that 10 million people will die in the battlefield. He predicts that it won't be a war between armies, it will be a war between nations and it will destroy nations. He, he actually says that the crowns will roll in the gutter and there will be nobody to pick them up that it will devastate the whole of society. Um, an uncanny piece of writing, and I, when I read it, I was quite astonished. I'd, I'd, I'd never read it before. Um, he understood that in the 1880s. By 1914, there were, there were others that understood it too, where we were headed. The likes of James Connolly in Dublin, John McLean in Glasgow, Rosa Luxemburg in Berlin, and Lenin, who was you know, um, exiled in Zurich, had understood that even although the common war of 1914 uh, might have been, what was the word, might have been unintentioned, it was going to be unstoppable except by socialist revolution. The ludicrous thing is that the British politicians um, claimed that 1914 would be the great war for civilization. Um, a noble cause for freedom. I mean, the, the medal that they struck for the soldiers that fought in it, that's what it says, that's what they fought for. They fought the Great War for Civilization. H.G. Wells went even further. He said that it would be the war to end all wars. Uh, it turned out to be the exact opposite. And aside from the scale of human suffering and the scale of the profits that was made, there was nothing really great about it. It was good for business. It was particularly good for American business. In 1916, John Rockefeller, the owner of Standard Oil, became the world's first billionaire. Between 1916 and 1919, America got 3,000 3, new millionaires. Um, 
Out of the war, Britain got a renewed empire, a fresh empire in the, the Middle East. It stole Egypt from Turkey, and it stole other parts of the Ottoman Empire that, interestingly, were oil-producing territories. Um, the, 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 the nonsense behind the Great War for Civilization was that Britain was going to war to defend uh, plucky little Belgium. Belgium was portrayed as the victim of an aggressive German militarism because Belgium had been invaded. And Belgium, if you looked at the map, was a tiny wee blob. Actually, Belgium was one of the worst colonial powers. If you look at the history of the Belgian Congo, which King Leopold stole from the people of Central Africa and plundered its resources and butchered its population and committed genocide, then Belgium could hardly be an innocent victim in this. Um, and Belgium was not alone. In 1870, most of Africa was still owned by Africans. By 1914, sub-Saharan Africa had been carved up into 23 possessions owned by six super-European powers. The imperialism meant war had already existed before, really, the First World War. Um, it was shown, as I said, in the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. It was shown nearly, there was a near war in 1906 and again in 1911 over Morocco, where both French and German interests were clashing. But the really dangerous place was the Balkans. Um, the rivalry between the great European powers there, Russia, Germany, Austro-Hungary, Britain and France, meant there was constant use of these little territories as client states by the superpowers. And that provoked two Balkan wars, 1912 and 1913. And Trotsky, who was a journalist, a war correspondent writing in the Balkan Wars said that all the treaties, all the, the truces that they have, aren't they going to prevent this exploding into a big war. And in 1914, the assassination of Arch the Archduke Ferdinand was the trigger that sparked the global war. So then, as a result of that, millions went out to fight for their masters and millions were slaughtered. Lenin's epoch of wars and revolutions had begun and it hadn't fallen out of the sky there were signs of it happening uh, in advance. Funnily enough, pre-war Britain is regarded, if you read the history books, as Britain's golden age. Britain's empire was at its zenith. Um, it covered the globe. Its economy seemed strong and powerful. And the Liberal government had just been re-elected in a landslide in 1910, 1910 under Asquith, and everything seemed wonderful. Um, unfortunately, something for them dramatic was about to explode. There's a, another good book that may be out of print, but if not, buy it. Uh, if you haven't read it, George Dangerfield's book, The Strange Death of Liberal England. And I'm going to read you a quote from that, because I think, again, he sums it up better than I can see it. He says... Uh, I'll find it. Yeah, here we are. Between 1910 and 1914, and against the wishes of their own leaders, the British workers plunged into a series of furious strikes, which but for the declaration of war would have culminated in September 1914 in a general strike of extraordinary violence. This man is not a revolutionary, by the way. In addition to, in addition to the great unrest, which was terrifying the, the government by 1913 and 14, and it got bigger towards August 1914, um, in addition to that, the suffragette movement was revising and the government were split over it. And the issue of Irish home rule was splitting the ruling class as well. People may or may not know, but in 19, early 1914, the uh, British general staff in Ireland threatened to really mutiny against the parliament unless home rule was stopped. So at that point, the British ruling class were in a real bind. They were badly split and there seemed no way out for them. And they were facing the biggest explosion in working class history that ever happened in Britain, the great unrest. Um, before anybody could blink, war was declared. And the period from January until August 1914, nine million days were lost through strikes. From the August to December, that collapsed to one million days. The mobilisation for war had seemed to have uh, 
knocked the movement right back. And that happened right across Europe because it wasn't just Britain where there was you know, massive unrest. It was happening right across Europe, Italy, Spain, uh, Germany as well. Um, and that really uh, was accompanied by the behaviour of the leadership of the socialist movement internationally, the Second International it was called. All the Labour and Socialist parties across Europe, right up until the outbreak of war, had committed themselves to oppose any common imperialist war, and they talked in terms of general strikes and a mass call to arms. And when the war broke out in 1914, when war was declared, the whole lot of them collapsed like a pack of cards. The leaders of virtually all the warring states sided with their own ruling classes. It was clearly a war for empire. It was clearly a war for profit. It was clearly a war for, for, for that, yet they supported it. I mean, at the time, Trotsky is reported to have said, Second International Socialism is like an umbrella with a lot of holes. It's wonderful until it rains. <laughs> and essentially, that's what happened. In Britain, um, the Labour and trade union leaders back to war. Ramsay MacDonald, the leader of the Labour Party, had doubts about the war. They toppled him. The, 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 the patriotic trade union bureaucracy sacked him and replaced him with a man called Arthur Henderson. Arthur Henderson was used by the coalition government to get the trade unions to sign up for social peace during the war and stop strikes. Um, ben Tiller, who folk, who folk will know, was a kind of heroic figure in the Great Dock Strike, Ben Tiller actually said, um, you know, he called for support for the war and said, in a strike, I support my class, right or wrong. In a war, I support my country, right or wrong. So that was why a lot of people were confused. Who, because if you look at the records, it's not true that nobody was opposed to the war. There were mass demonstrations in all the major cities. I mean, even in London, Keir Hardy was on a, a huge platform in Trafalgar Square calling for, an, for to stop the war before it happened. But when war was declared, that whole leadership evaporated and they all sided with their own sides. The predictions of a quick victory were dashed. Um, before the war, in the run-up to it, the generals and the politicians on either side were saying it would be all over by Christmas, that it would be a war for cavalry of manoeuvre and so on. Actually, that was dashed. It turned into an unrelenting bloodshed and slaughter that lasted four years. Um, by the end of 1915, there was despair and then disillusionment, both on the home front and on all the, on all the fronts, all the war fronts. The first real, I mean, apart from like strikes against the, the impact of the war, the first real rebellion against the war itself was the Dublin Easter Rising in 1916 that was crushed. And Lenin, Lenin, against critics who said that it was a putsch, Lenin said, no, no, we have to support it. The problem for the Irish was they, they rose too soon before the European revolt had matured. And it wasn't long until it did mature. By 1917, there was widespread opposition. Um, by early 1917, there were widespread rent strikes, food riots, strikes, and the beginnings of desertions and, 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 and mutinies in the army. But the key turning point was uh, January, February 1917. Um, the Russian economy was a, was a basket case. It was a backward um, feudal archaic structure and it collapsed under the weight of war. Um, to everybody's surprise, a group of textile women organised a strike against everybody's advice, against the most hardened revolutionary's advice in, in, in February 1917, against the fact that they had no bread. And that triggered the February Revolution in Russia. Uh, the Tsar, who weeks before had seemed all powerful, uh, was forced to abdicate in March. And... Such was the power, I think, of the, the, the Bolshevik programme and slogan, land, peace and bread, all power to the Soviets, that by November that year, the provisional Kerensky government had been toppled and the Russia was being run by a workers' government at the head of which was, was Lenin and Trotsky. And they immediately sued for peace. They published all the 
the background information, as they called it, about the war, the secret deals that had been done between the imperialist powers, the deals that we don't see, but they passed to each other, that proved what the war was really about, about who would ally with who and what they would get and so on. They published that. Um, and that had an, an enormous impact. It had an enormous impact right across the world, not just in Europe, but it had an enormous impact across the world. By November 1918, the growth of strikes the growth of rebellion in the German army, which is not recorded in the history books. We're told that the German army stood firm and steadfast right to the end. Actually, between 1917 and 1918, it is estimated that two million German soldiers or two million potential German soldiers deserted. Um, that, that and the growth of strikes in the German, among, in food riots and the growth of Workers' and soldiers' councils meant that in November 1918 the German Revolution broke out. The Kaiser and his government was toppled and the revolution spread. Um, I'm going to quote, I mean, Chris Harman makes the point that it spread right across, across Europe. Um, and I'm going to read a quote from his book, uh, People's History of the World. Um, and he says... For a period at the end of 1918, workers' councils were the only power all the way from the Ural Mountains to the North Sea. There was a world movement with its red armies in the Ruhr, as well as in Siberia, in Bavaria, as well as in the Don Basin, its workers' councils in Turin and Bremen. But this movement was destroyed in the West, most notably in Germany, Austria and Italy, by the influence in politics of social, de of social de democratic reformism. Instead of the European Revolution rising to the rescue of the beleaguered Russian Workers' Republic, European social democracy gave new life and new hope to the forces that wanted to crush that republic. And there's also, um, earlier Rosa Luxemburg had been terrified that although she welcomed the Russian Revolution, she was worried that it was going to be isolated. Rosa Luxemburg was being held in the German prison throughout the war for her anti-war opposition to it. And she wrote a letter at the end of 1917 to Louise Kautsky, her friend and also the wife of Carol Kautsky, that I talked about earlier. And Rosa Luxemburg uh, wrote this. Dear Louise, are you happy about the Russians? Of course they won't be able to, to maintain themselves in this witch's Sabbath. Not because statistics show economic development in Russia to be too backward, as your clever husband has figured out, but because social democracy in the highly developed West consists of miserable, wretched cowards who will look on and let the Russians bleed to death. And that's essentially what happened. The failure of the revolutions in Germany, Italy, Hungary and Austria weren't he down to the lack of courage and bravery in the part of the working class? It was because they didn't have a revolutionary leadership. And that meant that Russia was isolated. And Russian workers' democracy could not survive too long in those conditions. In Germany, the failure, that came to a head when, in January 19, a workers' uprising in Germany was defeated um, a premature workers' uprising and its leadership, including, tragically, Rosa Luxemburg, were murdered. And that was a watershed in, 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 in all the events. It then, we then, I've got five minutes left, so I'm going to have to get through the post-war settlement. Versailles. <laughs> Versailles I mentioned earlier. Um, Versailles was Max Hastings' view of the war. It's Germany to blame. Germany's going to be punched. But all it showed was the imperialist nature of every one of the combatants. Um, Germany was bled dry by Versailles. They were forced to pay the modern equivalent of 60 billion in reparations to the other allies. The allies, uh, a quarter of their coal, Germany's a huge, and then was a huge coal machine. Um, a quarter of Germany's coal production was stolen by the allies. Um, the allies, a million German civilians starved to death. And a lot of them starved to death after the war because the Allies kept the blockade in place until the Versailles Treaty was signed. And the people who suffered because of that were poor, ordinary German people starved to death. It's reckoned that a quarter of a million Germans died after the war as a result of the blockade. Um, the Allied powers, particularly Britain and France, uh, carved up. Germany lost a lot of its German territory and it lost all its overseas colonies. Britain and France divided them up between them. Britain, under Lloyd George, ensured that it built a new empire in the Middle East. Um, 
They stole Egypt. They stole Mesopotamia that became Iraq. Um, Lawrence, the Lawrence of Arabia and the film fame had promised the Arabs that if they fought the Ottoman Empire, which was their, if you like, oppressor, and they fought on the side of the Brits, then they would be given land and freedom at the end of the war. Um, the perfidious Albion, as they call it, ratted in that deal. They gave Palestine, set it up as a Zionist colony, stolen from the Arabs, and they did the same in Mesopotamia and Iraq. Um, there's a great quote I'm going to try and finish on, which emanates in the Fife mining community at the end of the war, and apparently it came from John McLean's education classes that he used to do on imperialism. And it's a joke, and he said, uh, John McLean's reputed to have said, why does the sun never set in the British Empire? And the answer was because God wouldn't entrust the imperialists in the dark. Right. <laughs> Which I think is as good a summation of Britain's war aims as anything else, and really something that we might want to finish on. Britain was on the eve of celebrating its greatest victory when it was shaken right to its foundations. Um, in 1919, it faced colonial revolt in Ireland, Egypt, Iraq, China, the West Indies. And at the time, it was facing a massive revolt at home, a revolt that was terrifying both the king and the cabinet because of the mass strikes, the mutinies in the army and the navy, and the police strikes. Um, in that, in that period, the working class has never come closer to its self-emancipation than any other time in history. And we have to understand that. That's what was at stake. We aren't just talking about the German Revolution. We're talking about a world, a possible world revolution. And it was snuffed out for the reasons that I said. Um, it's a long time since Lenin wrote imperialism. But he's been vindicated because the Versailles Treaty, all the Versailles Treaty did was, as Lloyd George said at the time, we will have to fight another war in 20 years' time. In the Second World War, whatever people like my dad thought of it was a war for empire as well. A war for empire. Um, the world that we live in, the society that we live in, is the bloodiest society there's ever been, the most barbaric society in human history. And as it gets older, it gets more barbaric. The weaponry of 1914, the dreadnoughts, the poison gas, is nothing compared to the barbarism they have at their disposal today. And there is no doubt they are nudging in that direction. Look at what's happening in Iraq, look at what's happening in the Ukraine, and the relentless, the relentless push of repartition, redivision, the, 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 the spoils, as Lenin called them, is what's happening today. I wrote my book, really, because I wanted to make a socialist history of the First World War, because most of the stuff you read is trap and clipe. Um, but I also wanted to, to commemorate the people that fought it, not just because they were right to fight it, because actually we're going to have to learn from their mistakes and their failures and their triumphs, because we will be facing the same kind of struggle. So I'll leave it there. Um, when Michael Gove made his defence of the First World War, Tristan Hunt, the Labour's Education uh, Secretary, made a reply saying, but we socialists were patriots. Well, that may well have been true of the Labour Party, but that wasn't true of our class. Some of the resistance was small and under the, under the big pages of history. Consider the porter the, on Darlington Station who encouraged a group of conscientious objectors being deported to France to carry on singing despite being ordered by the commander to stop. Consider the eight soldiers at a camp near Hull who refused to take part in the systematic punishment of conscientious objectors. Consider the Egyptian and Indian strikers at the port of Boulogne in 1917 who were who Haig ordered to be shot, 27 of them killed dead. But consider also the soldiers who went in to do their job, who also turned their ammunition on a cafe containing their officers and commanders in revenge. Consider the soldiers at the notorious Bullring camp in Etapla, who accidentally bayoneted, bayoneted their commanders. <laughs> Con Con they also shot them. <laughs> Consider those troops on the Russian and German front, who never mind the Christmas truces, 
also had their Easter truces, which went on for days on end. But there were also the unknown heroes. There's one man, Alexander Henderson, in York. He was a socialist, a sorter for the post office, and a conscientious objector. He was ordered to join the non-conscription corps, which meant he would have to take part in war work. He cycled out one day, on the day of his appeal, to a village just outside York, having written a letter to his mother. In the letter he said, I cannot fight and shoot on other people, nor can I make the shells to kill them. He hang himself on that day. These are the people of our class me. who fought back. Never mind Tristan Hunt and his class. These are our class fighters that we identify with. Thank you. Comrades, uh, Dave began his um, fantastic tour de force with a reference to Gove. And I think it's very important for us today to be central to our interpretation of the First World War and not to allow it to be interpreted uh, by our own ruling class and by ideologues like Gove in particular. What Gove said very specifically was that he didn't want the First World War to be taught to British children through the prism of the war poetry of Wilfred Owen. Now we should take that provocation as a challenge. So next year, in my AS literature course, our whole department has thrown out last year's books and introduced Wilfred Owen's collective poetry. We've introduced, we've introduced Re Regeneration by Pat Barker and a, a slightly less known uh, play uh, by R.C. Sheriff called Journey's End. And Owen is interesting in a, in a very particular way because he was a religious young man not essentially political, who became a junior officer uh, who saw his mission to represent his men, uh, to lead them in battle, but then primarily when he experienced the material experience of the trenches to represent them in his poetry in terms of their experiences and their suffering. It was an absolutely phenomenal task that he took on, but the way in which it materially transformed his own ideas turned him into probably the greatest anti-war poet of all time. And, and it's interesting that Dave mentions Graves, because Graves, who was not in favour of the war, was very critical of Owen. He said to him, Wilfred, you know you're a great poet, but why can't you write about something more cheerful? Why are you so bloody pessimistic? And Owen replied in a famous poem, Apologia, he said he had to write what he had experienced truthfully in the trenches on behalf of his men, and it was important that that message got out uh, to the wider British public. Can you sum up, so, please? Yeah, and the last point I want to make is this. He mentioned Belgium were doing a heart of darkness uh, at A-level as well, and actually, when the malai of the slogan that it was a war to end all wars uh, is repeated, we should say... Remember the legacy of Leopold and Belgium in the Congo today, where there is a horrendous war over rich mineral resources fought by multinational corporations and proxy governments. Sorry, and the legacy of imperialism is continuing war today. Uh, we appreciate the time. We ran too much yesterday. People ran on too long, including myself probably. Very quickly, um, as a 15-year-old, I went to the Belgian War Museum in Turbrun. Uh, and so the, some of the triptychs, the carvings, were horrific. As a 15-year-old, I didn't really understand what they were all about. Um, women and, and men portrayed on these carvings, uh, inverted, hot water, hot oil being poured into their genitals. So you can understand that was the sort of level of the Belgian Congo, uh, as we were talking about. Very briefly, I want to actually go back to... Dave's talk, because I think it's been brilliant to give us the background, the feel of it. 1878, in case you're interested, is where all this mess really started. By 1900, Germany had overtaken Britain as a second, the major, uh, not only imperialist power in the, in the sense, but the major industrial power, soon to be superseded by the United States. 
uh, all I would say to you is there are several books you ought to read if you want to understand where the hell we are. Anthony Sampson's uh, Seven Sisters, which is about big oil, tells you all about what you want to know. Trotsky's Balkan Wars, which is mentioned, uh, is well worth reading. And finally, I just point out to you, Winston Churchill, who ended up with slaughtering thousands of men in Gallipoli on a futile campaign, in 1944, when they invaded Greece and Italy, said, if you see anybody, shoot them. Don't worry about whether they're partisans, whether they're on our side, because they might be communists. Mm. So, you know, that's what we're really about. That's what the Tories are about. When I was very young, my father said to me, when I said the only good Tories are dead, when I come home from school, what are you talking about? By the time I was 20, I knew what he meant. <laughs> I think it's difficult for us to uh, imagine the shock for uh, revolutionary socialists when the war broke out because uh, 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 Dave mentioned the, the umbrella with the holes in it. People thought there was going to be a mass movement against the war. And because of reformism, it never happened. In, I mean, when Lenin read uh, what was going on in Germany, he didn't believe it. He said, these, these newspapers saying that the Germans have collapsed and are supporting the war, German socialists, it must be a forgery. And this was a shock that went right across... And so the question is, what did people do about it? And it was really, really hard. Rosa Luxemburg, when German, Germany collapsed, she's in Germany, she wants to build an anti-war movement, she sent out 300 telegrams to people, people she hoped would back her up. She got one reply from Clara Zetkin, and that was it. That was it. Nobody else. And you'd think, as socialists, and we, we'd be faced with, we could be faced with that sort of situation. Is that the end of it? It certainly wasn't. Because Dave described it, within four years, these people were leading movements of millions. Where did it come from? It came from organisation. Because who was, the, who was the person, not the person, the movement, that stopped the, second, uh, the First World War? It was Lenin. Why was it Lenin rather than Luxembourg or Maclean and, that, and the others? It's because he had an organisation of revolutionaries. He, wasn't, he didn't have to send out a telegram to find out if somebody supported him. There was an organisation there and they were able to move from being in extreme isolation to actually winning the world. And in a sense, we're all in that situation when you've got Islamophobia, you've got racism here, you've got UKIP there, you've got all of this coming at us. And you could easily say, well, let's adapt, let's join the Labour Party, let's do something to make it a bit easier. If you stick to your principles and you're organised... World War uh, One shows we can win. Um, yeah, two things. I've, I've already read Dave's book, and I think one of the key messages that runs through it does, you know, come back to, to what the speakers just said um, about the question of leadership and how all that potential was there and was really thrown away by the, the failure of leadership across so much um, of Europe. But what Dave does really brilliantly in the book is bring out some of those stories of the struggles that started to take place um, as the war went on, and particularly um, uh, from 1917 onwards. And um, there's a fantastic story about Italy um, in 1917, where after the, um, the first Russian revolution in February, uh, it started to inspire people, workers in factories around, um, uh, uh, around all uh, you know, the places that were part of the war. Um, because really, you know, there'd already been strikes, there'd been struggles taking place over the economic hardship caused by the war, but it wasn't really pulling together with a sense of, you know, that the war was wrong, this was what was missing, you know, there was like almost economic struggles, but the political ones um, weren't happening. There's a brilliant story of how in five minutes that step can be taken um, during a, a strike in a factory um, in Italy, this is in August of 1917, where the um, the economic conditions were terrible. Um, bakeries were stopping opening. There wasn't bread, basically, for people. Um, and there were people demonstrating for bread. And workers at a factory came out, um, uh, came out on strike, and they started chanting, we haven't eaten, we can't work, give us bread. So management came out and promised to order bread if they went back to work. So then they started shouting, to hell with the bread. Uh, we want peace, down with the government, down with the war. You know, and this was like uh, the, the trajectory that was there, that was inside the working class movement. Um, and that went on to become, you know, riots where the police attacked them and stuff um, uh, for days. Um, and I think that um, what you get, I think, from, from Dave's book is a sense of how important the First World War is for our tradition of revolutionary politics, how much of our understanding of, of the modern world of capitalism came out of that period because it concentrated all of those battles together and, uh, you know, and, and Lenin and the Bolsheviks were, were best able to kind of distill, 
distill those things. So I think for our own tradition of revolutionary socialism, it's a crucial period to study, but also, as people have said, um, you know, to battle against the, um, the kind of official commemorations, which, you know, uh, a lot of the time local councils want to make it about boosting the morale of soldiers today and stuff like this. This is not what these commemorations should be about. They should be about exactly the kind of things that people are talking about in schools, fighting for the anti-war tradition uh, uh, and for an anti-capitalist tradition. Hi, uh, Ray Holmes, Chesterfield SWP. When you think about the excellent material that Jerry's produced and the other people that spoke about the war, we seem to forget that, or at least there's a tendency to forget, what's going on now. And if, when you think about what this government thinks about us, working people, remember one thing only. This government, this Prime Minister, has put £55 million to re-educate our children and our grandchildren. Now I've got 18. They're not all mine, by the way. They don't all belong to me. But I've got 18 kids who are growing up now in the 12, 13, 14 age group. And he wants us to educate them how to kill. And if you think about what Gove is on about, it's forget your loyalty to your class. Remember your loyalty to the ruling class. And that's what this government's going to do. £15 million has been set aside at the same time as we're putting food to one side to, sell in, to get rid of in, in food shop. Mm -hmm. Unemployed kids doing absolutely nothing and romping on the street. That's what they think about us. And I'm saying to you, Let's reverse the roles and tell them what we think of them and get rid of the bloody lot. Come forward. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the forces that want to defend the First World War are, are getting quite sophisticated these days. Usually they don't say it was glorious to die for your country. They're not, they they realise that won't work anymore. So what they like to do, first of all, is they like to choose the questions. What are the important questions? If you, get, if you choose the questions, you're halfway there. And their favourite question is, what would you have done if you'd been Herbert Asquith? You know, which uh, interpreted is, you know, what would you have done if you were the chosen representative of the most bloody empire in history? Whereas we need to be answer we need to choose the question, what should Ben Tillett have done, uh, 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 a working class hero of the time? What should Emmeline Pankhurst, the, the leader, not a left winger, but the leader of a democratic movement at the time, and, and say, you know, what was possible to have built a, a movement against the war at that, at, at, at that time? And I think we're going to find also with the commemorations, they're, going, they're getting quite sophisticated. They're, they're, they're saying, you know, everybody's experience counts. It sounds very democratic, very popular, you know. We want to know about your great grandfather's experience and your great grandfather's those experience and they were all heroes uh, uh, you know and now they like to include uh, women's experience and coloured people's experience all as part of rehabilitating the commemoration of this horrible imperial war and I think one of the things that Could we need to say up, uh, back to that is if we're looking for heroes we can find plenty of heroes in the great unrest we can find plenty of heroes uh, in, the, in the suffragettes and the suffragists we don't we need to re re reject this idea that our ancestors begin being important in 1914 and stop being important in 1918. We want to say there were heroes, but it went in a completely different direction from this uh, horrible, bloody tragedy. Thank you. One more speaker. Uh, I think what we also has to be remembered is that although in the First World War there were millions of people died, there were also millions of people who returned to the war as disabled, as disabled people. And these disabled people were... Uh, well, uh, well, although they came back losing their legs, their arms and sight, they didn't come back losing their, their will to stand up for the country. But because of the way that Kitchener saw these re returning soldiers, he didn't want them to stand up and fight for the right. So we got organisations that are like radar that actually suppressed disabled people coming from the war, back from the war. And then unlike in Germany, where these people were given the freedom to stand up and fight 
for the rights which, in fact, 20 years later led to them being attacked by the Nazis and millions of us of dying. And the reason, point I'm making is it actually reflects very well now in today's society. Because if you look at the disabled people of today who are standing up in coalition and in their own in independent organisation, people like Ian Duncan Smith and the coalition are doing exactly the same thing to disabled organisations and groups as, as the uh, fascists did in 1930, so it's about realising the mistakes of this fact and that disabled people need to stand together with everybody because it's, not, it's that that works. Thank you. I, w I wouldn't be long because there, there isn't really anything contentious and I agree with everything that folks said from the floor. Um, I, just on the last point, there's a bit in the book about um, a young unemployed soldier who comes back from the war. And his quote is, I was sick to see my former comrades, one-legged men selling matches in the gutter. He said, a land fit for heroes, you'd need to be a fucking hero to live in it. <laughs> and it's not, it's not any, it's not any, uh, it's not, you know, strange that, in, for example, in the the 40-hour strike in Glasgow, a big demonstration for the shorter working week. Huge contingents of the demonstration in Glasgow that was attacked were unemployed soldiers because that was the big thing, that they came back. They'd, even the people who'd fought and hadn't deserved had come back from the war to see what had happened and what it was all about and were incredibly embittered about it. Um, and they, they were part of the huge wave of discontent at the end of the war. The other thing I wanted to say was the point that Donnie made. I mean, there's an argument that said, that, oh, the problem with the First World War was that the working class supported it to the hilt. The, the, there was jingoism, there was massive patriotism, people went to the colours. Now, there's an element of that, true. There was a lot of jingoism, even in the working class. I mean, if you read, like, Willie Gallagher's book, Revolt and the Clyde, he talks about, you know, his own class, how enthusiastic they were about the war. And there's a, there's a quote from Trotsky uh, when he says the same thing was happening in, in Vienna where he was in exile. He said, but this really isn't a patriotism. This is a measure of how miserable people's lives are, that it's some adventure, that people were conned in to go to fight. I mean, my own grandfather lied about his age when he was 14. He came from a mining village and he didn't want to be a miner. He ran away and, 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 and lied about his age, joined the army and got shot at Ypres. He became a socialist. I think there was hundreds and hundreds of people like that. Um, that, that we need to talk about. Donnie's point about the, the, the Bolsheviks is ab absolutely important. What folks should know is that in 1914, when they mobilised for war, there were big strikes in the Putilov factories against the, 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 the call-ups. I mean, it wasn't that everybody was massively in favour of the war. The problem was that their leadership, with the exception of like the Serbians and the Bolsheviks, the leadership of all the socialist parties supported the war. And that disarmed at first the people who were against the war and put them in the back foot. But that changed, that changed by the experience of the war itself, not just in the trenches, but in the home front. If you look at the stuff that happened, the, the, the things that um, Sally mentioned about about Turin. Um, these were happening in Germany as well. You know, bread, bread. I mean, the first workers' council in Germany came out of riots by women over food. Um, and that, that triggered the other ones. And that, that happened right, right across the, the, the piece. The thing I want to finish on, because I meant to mention it and I didn't, is a thing called the British West Indian Regiment. I never knew about this until I started to write the book. Um, there were thousands of uh, West Indians corralled into fighting for the war, and they, they volunteered because they were. They were told that they would, because they fought in the war on the side of Britain, they would be treated better in the West Indies. They ended up mutiny in Taranto because they were refused pay and they were supposed to be demobbed and they were forced to dig latrines and ditches and, and, and put up barracks for the officers. And they weren't going to get paid for it or they weren't going to get back. And they, they mutinied. And, and like as the chap said earlier about the, what they did to people, they were, they were rounded up. Some of them were jailed for years. A guy was was put before a firing 
squad and shot. But what actually happened was those soldiers, when they went back to the West Indies, they took part in the riots against imperialism in the West Indies and joined big mass strikes in the West Indies. And you don't ever read about any of these things. So I really think it's quite important that we understand the depth of opposition that there was, and particularly the depth of the opposition at the end of the war. So that when I say the prospects for socialists and the opportunity for a different world were there. There is absolutely no doubt about that when you read the stuff. Were there. The problem was one of working class leadership. Um, and that's, that's the fundamental lesson, I think.